and now we are recording the final segment so for once i'm going to have the demonstration at the end here and that is because i did not know how long it would take me to finish the drawing so i didn't want to run out of energy in the middle of that since this uh, project might end up taking quite a lot of time and energy as well so what did i want to uh, talk about character design And the main thing is uh, how to keep how to draw characters that look distinct from each other. This is um, stereotypically, of course, an anime problem, but it appears in other drawn media as well. Uh, I think in you know European, particularly French, also Italian um, comics. This is a bit lopsided. It seems that Europeans are are more willing to draw ugly men but unfortunately are not willing to draw ugly women so you end up with sets of character designs where the men are all distinct from each other but all of the women look the same uh, for example the classic uh, Lupin the third from Monkey Punch from Japan also falls into this category in general I think Lupin looks looks more like um, French or Italian style than a stereotypical Japanese one where exactly he got his influences, I'm not uh, privy to, but uh, he has that, ha had that problem of all the, since all of the women had to look perfect, he only had one way for the women to look. So telling them apart at a glance is extremely difficult. So uh, if you want characters to look different, there are a lot, um, there are a few things you can change about them. One is of course the face. This might be the most uh, difficult if you want everyone to look cute. Second one is the body. This might be a little bit easier to work with. And the third one is posture. This is a bit more, you know, easy to characterize with but I think it might take a little bit more skill on the drawing side of things to make it work. So, when we start on the face, what kind of things do we have here that, um, that you can change to vary things around? First off, You are probably going to have more or less uh, a similar top. Uh, top of the head from the front. Uh, some people have enough of a camel hump here that it's visible from the front. Uh, I do, for example. Mm, I'm going to do some color, color coding here. So there's the shape of the skull. Do you draw it like more kind of a uh, two humped one? Do you draw it more curved? For characters with a lot of hair, this is not going to be particularly visible, of course. Then you have the brow ridge. It's another one that's going to be more useful for male characters. There is always some amount of brow ridge, and it's, it's a good idea to draw it in. Um, even if you're not going to use it in the line art since it's a uh, you know a point on the face that um, fits well together with the uh, general breakup so you've got like the hairline you've got the uh, brow ridge you've got the um, bottom of the nose hole and then you've got the chin here about all of them about uh, the same um, distance apart from each other and then you've got the bridge of the nose here. For some people, it just turns forward. For some people, it turns backwards. Uh, you might want to play around with this. If you don't want... Um, it can 
make the brow ridge look more robust if you have it uh, turned back here. For you know, real people, I think it's it's more stereotypically feminine to have it um, have it turning back, so you know, more looks more cute. Then you have uh, the midpoint of the nose. This is another point where something can happen. This is where the um, the cartilage of the nose comes to an end. So you start here. And you have the tip of the nose. So you could have something like this. And then another knob here. And then maybe another knob for the uh, tip of the nose. Or you might want to have a gentle curve throughout. And then maybe a, a gen gentler knob. This might be more of a you know, typical um, anime looking aesthetic. Or you might want it really coming da back down. And then come up. Something like this. What else can you do with it? Hmm? You have it, uh, have the brow ridge curving back and then an elegant line. I think this is, this ends up looking more aggressive. So you might want this kind of, um, you know, low divot and then gen gentle curve if you're going for a uh, more of a more character design. So. Then you've got the tip of the nose here. Another thing that um, they can develop in different ways. Um, for some people, this turns uh, back a lot. For some people, it turns back uh, less. And for some people, this is sort of a, sort of a, almost like a pig snout. That's uh, not something that I think look, looks good, but can be something that you can use for character design, of course. Something to keep in mind is that you probably don't, even if you if you want to draw several characters that are all supposed to be attractive, but you don't want them all to look exactly the same, you know, pick some feature that they have a less attractive variant of. So you might have someone with, who is otherwise um, beautiful, but has a very, very upturned nose. And then you have you have a something that is immediately visible from a lot of different angles. And if nobody else has the same kind of nose in your design in your set of designs, it will also be easily identifiable. Uh, and then there's the nostrils, more of a part of this, of course. Uh, nostrils often get just straight up uh, abstracted away. The way I would draw nostrils is to follow the um, side plane of the nose and you get into the front plane of the... So here's, here's the lips. Something like this. And this is the area that you want to work with. The cartilage of the nose comes back straight, since that is exactly what the cartilage does. And after that, the nostrils are entirely uh, soft tissue. Changing layers here and changing into blue. You might want to have a sort of a bounding box for the nose. And then Take a part of that and spread it to the side as a box. And then you have a sort of a schematic uh, nostril here that you would probably want to, you know, curve around a little bit. And the hole is going to be somewhere around here. You can just draw in the hole of the nostril without really constructing it fully. This is something that you see a lot of, you know, uh, more moe artists doing. Might be something to um, think about for you as well. 
After that, we have the, the lips. What can you do there? Well, there's the question of prominence, of course. You might have them protrude more. But they are going to protrude some amount in, in all people. When you look at, uh, think of the skull, you've got the cartilage here. You've got the chin here. You've got a bit of a, a curve out from the teeth themselves. And because of this, the lips are always going to have a sort of um, jut to them. But what you can play with is the angle at which they open, more or less. And of course the volume, so you can have, you know, very, uh, very thick lips, very thin lips, things like that. Um, the filtrum is something that's rarely drawn into very stylized characters, unless as, uh, as shadows. Uh, a missing filtrum is a symptom of a lot of devel devel developmental disabilities. So if you are drawing a detailed character, you might want to throw it in in some way, even if you are keeping it quite um, abstract, abstracted or cutified in other ways. So then on the center line, you have the chin. This is again something that can uh, protrude more. It can protrude less. Uh, for some people, it can even recede. Um, stereotypically, the middle variants are seen as more, more attractive. A jutting chin can be attractive for men, I think. But it's maybe something that you would use for, you know, crones, which is bodybuilders, machos, that kind of thing. So. Ah, the forehead as well. The uh, angle of the forehead is not is not static. There are people who have more of a, a bubble forehead. This might be something that you see in, you know, anime character designs, but I have seen it in on real people as well. So it might be even even seem to jut out in front of the brow, uh, uh, clearly in front of the brow ridge. Uh, this might be relatively straight. Um, it might be straight up and down. It might be straight uh, sloping backwards of a stereotypical um, Neanderthal structure. There's a famous Russian boxer who has an extreme, extremely um, sloping forehead. And I think that's it on the, on the main line here. Then you start getting into the sides of the head. There's the, the jawbone is something that um, is also a very typically um, has is a typical sex I think it is a tertiary sexual characteristic at this point so primary are the ones that you actually used to reproduce with secondary ones are like or oh, is this a second secondary one breasts and things like that are secondaries but where the line between second and third comes in, I'm not quite sure. Anyway, you can have uh, the jawbone jutting out. This is perhaps not massively common today. I've got some of that going on. Um, a lot of bodybuilders have that going on since a large amount of uh, testosterone is going to do that. Um, and for historical characters, a lot of you know, craftsmen who would have been using their mouth to grab things with their, their skeletons also have quite a large um, jawline. You can keep it a lot more neutral, like if you wanted to draw a, a modern male character who is not does not have massive testosterone, does not inject testosterone and does not use their jaw as a tool. You might want to draw something like this. And on the extreme side, of course, um, turned in. This is almost universal for anime characters. Uh, but it doesn't have to be. You could have something in, 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 the, in between here. And then there's the width of the chin, of course. When we get to the front, you can have this uh, 
relatively narrow. I, for example, have a, a broad jawbone, but a relatively narrow chin. Uh, someone that I know once said that I look like Nappa from Dragon Ball, which is, uh, I guess, vaguely, uh, vaguely correct. Here you will have, you can have a, a variety of, you know, sharper chins, you know, kind of sharp but still rounded, and then once you get into, you know, straight up, um, you know, historical craftsmen and um, steroid abusers, you can have this kind of like a box, straight up box chin here, and maybe a a um, division in it. So. If you are imagining the, you know, caricature of a superhero is going to have white uh, jawbone, uh, white chin, and this sort of um, cleft here in the middle. Not necessarily on, um, you know, cute young girls. What else do we have here? I guess in general, the width of the head might be more you know rounded the general aesthetic of the face can can change a bit so on one extreme you can have something like this and then not really look not trying to make it look like a, like a sectoid or a gray alien but it can sort of bulge out here a little bit is another you know stereotypical anime character design feature or I guess for me it would be more like this so there's sort of a narrowing in the middle and then it bulges out again something that comes to these skulls of people is that they are okay, looking up at it from above you have the frontal bone or frontis, so the bone of the forehead, and then you have a um, cleft down the middle, and then you have these uh, top segments here. The result is that uh, the skulls of uh, children and uh, women who have less muscles around their head are going to stay sort of um, angular like this, whereas if you want to draw a You know, absurd, absurd macho head that would be would actually be a lot more rounded everywhere. This might be something that you might not think of as a character design element, since roundedness is usually you know visually connected with femininity, but in the case of the general outline of the human skull, it's the opposite. If you draw a cute girl from above, probably give her this one. So, um, at the level of the face, I think the rest of it is going to be something that's not really, you know, head related. It's more facial features. And I think it's going to make a lot of sense to get into those at this point. So the next one is then the um, the whole body. Let's think about that a little bit. So you are going to have the proportions of the body, of course. You've got the head, then you've got the neck here, then you have some angles here. And this angle is going to be uh, larger for women than it is for men. Then you have the legs here. And the feet, of course. And this is a very um, upright posture. Something that affects the posture a lot is not just, um, you know, their way of living, but also the amount of muscles that they have. So if you see someone who is very thin and has their 
neck forward like this. It doesn't necessarily mean that they spend their time hunch over a computer. It just means that they don't really have the large muscles up here to pull it back, um, back like this. Uh, the same applies, of course. And well, this is this really a mixture of body and posture. Well, let's do them at the same time. Then you have the shoulders. Again, stereotypically, someone who works with computers the entire time uh, would have kind of a you know hunched back, the um, shoulders pulled forward. But what actually pulls the shoulders forward is um, having one-sided tension on them. So if you have stronger breast muscles than back muscles, then it's going to lead to the um, shoulders moving forwards. This is actually something that can happen to, say, hobbyist bodybuilders that do a lot of working out on the front of their body so that they can show their large breasts and their large shoulders and their large, uh, large biceps, but they neglect, neglect their pulling uh, moves. So if you don't want this to happen to you, um, do some rowing, of preferably barbell rowing, of course, but pulling, pulling on things, pulling things to your chest is going to work against this. And of course, um, on the other side, people who do not use their body are more likely to have um, this kind of forward slouched posture. So moving forward, there's the angle between the torso and the hip. This is generally uh, larger for women, smaller for men. But uh, also it is going to be higher for sitting people. Again, if, if you stay in one position the entire time, uh, you do not develop strength on the opposite side. So sitters are going to have underdeveloped uh, front and they are going to have a bit of an overdeveloped back and the result is again pulling like this. So our uh, inactive man here would probably not have it uh, quite this uh, extreme. There's a kind of a you know, protruding below the belly. Something that uh, happens to a lot of um, office workers to some extent. Less so if they work out, more so if they don't, and so on and so on. Then getting into the legs, I don't think there's a lot of, uh, you know, postural differences that come up here. It's mostly um, going to come down to the proportions. And same with the arms. So that's probably most of, most of the most important posture bits. So then we get into the proportions. As all of you probably know by now, I like to measure by drawing sort of balls. And I'm going to draw a lot of them here and work myself work my way down to demonstrate how this is supposed to work. So let's say you've got the you know neutral classical um, ideal person. The first head here, uh, first ball here. Let's make it a bit, a bit taller. Is um, the head? You cut off three fourths of it for the. I guess between three fourths, two thirds. I remember it as two thirds, but when I try to draw two thirds, it's always too little. So I just jack it up a little bit. Uh, this is the side plane of the of the head. This is also where the uh, skull comes to an end in the back. So you have here, you have the hairline, then you have the brow ridge, then you have the um, bottom of the nose, 
and then the same amount down is the end of the jaw so the let's say canonical uh, head proportions are like this so you will have the nose between here then you will have the mouth between here and then you will have the chin here uh, the mouth is about one half of this one third here so ends up being one sixth the ear is um, the one third here so you get the neck here and once you are down one ball we try to keep the uh, balls more proportional here when you are down one ball you are already at the level of the clavicles so the um the collar bones so you are going to have let's say the first half of this ball is going to be the um the shoulder muscles so you have some area in between here but not that much difference between the chin and the start of the uh, shoulder muscles here as you do have some area behind here that is you know just straight no longer has large muscles in it and then the classical measurement is that you would have four balls until the bottom of the uh, torso However, every time that I draw it like that, it ends up uh, looking far too long. So I prefer to use three. So we are going to have the um, upper body and the hips come to an end by this point. Maybe you should think of, um, maybe I misremember the way I, I learned this. And maybe it should be, you know, four balls from here, from the base of the skull. Who knows? Anyway. The sternum starts here, and it is one ball long. So you are going to have the end of the sternum, you know, the, the bone in the middle of the um, rib cage, have the one ball. Then you have uh, another ball until the end of the actual end of the um, rib cage here, and then. You are basically going to have one ball for the uh, for the hip bone back here. Uh, looking at it from the front, you are going to get um, looking at it from the front is easier to or, or more useful to use for character design. So you have the width of the uh, chest. You might want to play with the length as well. Um, for example, you might give a character a long back, uh, short legs, make sort of a gorilla um, design. I've seen people like that in real life. Uh, it looks kind of weird. And of course, this caricature of a superhero is again uh, short legs, longer back, very long arms. But the width is something that you can um, use without going into extreme caricatures. Again, the, let's say, canonical width of the neutral human body is about uh, two of these balls. Uh, you can then turn it into three if you want to have a the, quite a wide, you know, bodybuilder type, extreme uh, male skeleton. Or you could have it... Uh, a little bit thinner, I guess, for a, a gracile woman. And same with the with the hips here. But remember that in, in general, the length of the rib cage is going to be the same as the width of the hip bone. But that the shoulders and the absolute uh, broadest point of what we visually see as the hips are going to be at different uh, locations. So you might have the edge of the hip bone. It's going to be here. But then you have the leg bone jutting a bit from it. And then you are going to even have some meat on top of it. So if you think of uh, things in terms of, you know, visual width. Then 
<clears throat> this here would give much more of a you know female um contour to it so you might actually if you want if you have a certain you know width of uh, or thickness of character in mind you might want to start with the bounding box and you know reserve space for the shoulder here so you want your character to be visually this wide so that means that you cannot have any of the ribcage in this area when you start drawing in your ribcage you make sure that it is thin enough to fit here in between and you might you, you do the same for the uh, hips as well use the visual width of them as the uh, either bounding box and make sure that you make the bone small enough that you don't end up with so for example if you wanted the hips to be this wide and you draw the bone this large then you are going to get some you know weird fetish level of huge hips at the end here which of course you might want to do and if you want to do it you should do it knowingly if you don't want to do it then avoid doing things like that so uh, next step we get into the legs they attach around here they come out the leg bone comes out a little bit and then it goes back in a little bit and what it is it, it generally starts at uh, this level here so let's say the middle of the bottom ball and now of course the balls are not partic being particularly helpful i'm going to draw in some bit better edges here so you have one two two and a half or three so generally as a rule of thumb the um the upper leg is going to have the same length from its socket to the knee as it does from its socket to the underarm so that's going to be somewhere around here so this here is going to be the same as this here but it can be um, a bit longer for example for me it comes up all the way here uh i think for vocaloid characters it can even come up to the neck so you wouldn't expect someone to be able to kick themselves in the chin without bending over but you know vocaloid or clamp character designs would easily be able to do that this is again something that you want to vary for your character design i tend to draw characters with extremely long legs because i myself have extremely long legs so i have this sort of instinct for for long legs uh I'm in this camp, so it, it comes up to the level of my shoulder, which is also the level of the uh, clavicle. And then that is going to be, let's go with the classical amount here. So that's going to be two other half. So here's another half, then there's another, and there's another. So everything fits. And then we have the lower leg I'm going to block in three for this and I am going to make it as long as the upper leg this is another one of those things that are uh, is not necessarily the case this is more common for women um, I had my bones measured at university and it turns out that out of the group I was the only man with um, the same length shin bone as uh, thigh bone so if you are drawing men you probably want to keep this a little bit uh, shorter and then at the very bottom we have the final half ball and this is where the foot comes in So here we have two and a half, two and a half, and a half. This might be good for a neutral character design, might 
work for a man as well. If you wanted to make it like a, a short-legged man, you might clip off a ball, a half a ball here and a half a ball here, and then you'd have relatively short legs, but they would still be relatively proportional to each other. If you wanted to go, you know, full short shins, uh, clip another half ball here. So, and then again, the size of the foot is going to be something that changes, is variable, but as a rule of thumb, you can take one unit for that, and it is from the back of the of the back of the foot that's a little bit further back than the bone here maybe in line with something like the back of the um of the bones here but i'm not quite sure that's getting into some really detailed um anatomy that i am not familiar enough with to pull just out of my head and the other side in front where it comes up to uh, this one ball, that is the um, the end of the in uh, of the bones within the foot. So it's it's this is like of the knuckles area for um, for the foot. And at that point, you start having the toe bones. I use like maybe one third area for this. I usually just you know draw them in on instinct. I don't really have a huge huge method for the for the size of the toes. The size of the foot is also something that you can play around with. Maybe smaller for you know more delicate characters, larger for more robust characters, that sort of thing. And then looking at it from the front again, the uh, the hip bone as um as its own thing. This is again something that is different between men and women. Uh, it is more high for men. So to begin with, you would expect a, you know, the, uh, let's say average, canonical, a canonical uh, man would have a slightly longer back uh, than the canonical woman, but would have more on this this way and uh, less in this way whereas the canonical woman would have a wider but uh, not quite as high a hip bone and then of course there's the uh, the flare of the ribs here this uh, boxy flared um, structure is more typical for men Kind of a you know arch arching here is then more typical for women something that you can play with as a character design thing apart from that from the front there's relatively little change here and um, then you have the the legs coming forward and this is going to be something that uh, is, is a bit different for men and women. Um, I remember learning about this in the context of the chimpanzee hip bone. Uh, I took some physical anthropology in university, but that was a long time ago. And the thing is that when the hip is higher, like it is for men, you end up having to have a, uh, a slighter angle here. Uh, hello, Nightmare Tia. Uh, I think that's uh, some sort of an amused face. Um, so you end up with sort of a different angle here, depending on where it attaches on the hip. And this is going to have some effect on the walk as well. Um, you know, men are going to sway at the top more. This is again something that when chimpanzees um, walk this way an awful lot side to side. I distinctly remember the professor imitating the chimpanzee's walk cycle, which was uh, quite funny. So what else do we have here? And we've got the, the long bone here. 
not a lot of cost to do that. But what we do have is uh, is the knees. So I think it is called um, knock knees in English when you have it uh, like this. So your leg bends in and then bends back out again. So um, I think this is bordering on dangerous every time I, look, I see a person uh, with an extreme case of this it looks like they are about to break their bones to me but i'm not a medical anatomist so i don't know if it's actually that dangerous uh, the other possibility is then to be bow-legged so you end up with this um, hole between your legs uh, when standing up uh, this is stereotypical for cowboys, people who ride. I don't know if it actually, if riding actually causes that in, um, in the long run. It might, but it's a, it's a common stereotype and you might want to take advantage of it for a character design. Uh, this is much more common, I think. Um, I think this is probably the most common variant of these. So in this case, the ankles are touching, but the knees are not touching. In the case of being knock kneed, the knees touch, but the um, uh, but the ankles do not touch. Of course, you have the possibility of both of them touching. This is the case for me, for example. But I think this is relatively rare, anatomically speaking. I think this is the this is the most likely one that you're going to run into. So what else do we have? Do we have anything more on the lower body? I think that's mostly going to be it. So let's um, move on into the back into the upper body. body. I'm going to have some space here. So depending on the configurations of the hip bone and the uh, chest bones that you have selected, you might end up with a sort of, you know, more of a macho um, profile, or, you know, more of a um, white hips profile, or you might end up with relatively straight up and then shoulders here. Um, I've got pretty much this going on. I've got a very you know, thick the uh, deep chest, barrel chest, and a lot of uh, flaring. And then compared to that, um, relatively wide hips. But then as I am in fact a man, I don't have that much uh, flaring going on down here. So it's the hip is like this, and then there's a little bit of flaring going on for the, um, for the thighs, but not that much. And then the shoulders. Shoulders are... Uh, definitely and clearly wider than the hip, even visually. So, then we have the arms. The arm, of course, attaches around here. And it is, the upper arm is, again, around two balls long. Looking at the bone, it has this sort of um, a ball socket. And the long bone attaches at the outside here. And it has a slight, again, a slight curve like this, much like um, the thigh bone, but in reverse. They both have the same function. So the shin bone can index between, between these positions here. And the forearm bones can then index between the extended position here. and up to here functionally very similar so the upper arm is canonically two balls so two skulls uh, the lower arm is then two balls including the palm so this is already getting into the hand area Mm. 
I got my confu myself confused here a little bit. So this, assuming that the balls here are broadly correct, they are they are broadly correct. This is going to be the palm. This is going to be the long bones. Uh, so the, not really the balls. Balls are not really correct. The throwing was more or less correct. I'm going to redraw the balls a little bit. More like this. So about half ball for the palm and another half ball for the fingers. Again, something that you can uh, play around with. Maybe you want large hands, maybe you want small hands. Depends on how you want to do it. And then the fingers are again half and half and half. So once you have blocked in the length of your Let's say this. Let's say you've blocked in your arm here. You can just first draw it entirely straight. So this is the forearm. Then you can rotate the wrist here. Like for a, a, a body bodybuilder pose. This is going to be the Form. So this this ball here is the wrist. Then you can again you have the same length here, but if you half it up, this is going to be the first knuckle. And then once again half and half. So doing a sort of uh, trying a sort of a bodybuilder pose, you end up with um with the forearm here, coming down to the wrist. And it's probably not going to rotate entirely to 90 degrees. Um, mine doesn't at least. So you end up with something more like this. This is the wrist. And then you have the fist coming up something like this. So there's almost a 90 degree, almost a 90 degree bend here, but probably not quite. Or something like this. Hmm, I think that's um, about it when it comes to the bones. There's some uh, when it comes to muscle insertions. There's also a couple of things that you can think about. Let's throw a schematic skeleton. Skeleton's arm again. So we are going to have. Come up around here, and then I'm just going to draw a box for the fist. So the biceps attach at the ball here, and they attach at the collar um, at the collarbone here, and they attached at the at the outside here on the outside bone of the forearm. But what where they differ between people is how far along in this um, on this line the actual muscle itself begins so when you have a muscle you have some amount of tendon and then you have some amount of tendon at the opposite side as well and then you have a muscle in bet in between And the length of the tendon here is not constant. It can be more or less. So you can have a, a character with quite a long tendon here, and then a very blocky muscle, and then a very long tendon again. Or you can have a character with a short tendon and a short tendon, and then more of a longer, a visually longer muscle. I don't think this influences the strength of the muscle at all. As far as I know, it's only the uh, cross section of the uh, muscle that affects its strength. But you are going to have, you are going to see more bodybuilders with this kind of um, 
you know, stumpy muscles because it looks bigger. And of course, for bodybuilders, it's a question of looking big as opposed to uh, being strong. Being strong is a side effect for bodybuilders. So, do I have something more to go on into? We are closing on on one hour for this segment. So, I think it's probably going to be more or less as designed. Hmm. I think that is uh, probably going to be that uh, it for today. So, time to stop recording. Thank you to everyone uh, possibly watching afterwards on YouTube. I hope you've enjoyed yourself and I hope you've uh, learned something.